Welcome to Saks Realty's Tuesday Night Podcast, where we talk about anything and everything real estate. Each week, we deliver expert information, enabling you to make better informed decisions while keeping more money in your pocket. If you're interested in real estate, this is your show. Welcome to our Tuesday Night Podcast. A lot in the news today. We have a great guest lined up. Mike Maloney is uh, in Puerto Rico, live with us tonight. We're going to talk about lots of stuff, especially the book, The Great Taking. We're going to talk about that and get Mike's take on that. But I want to start by saying that at 4 o'clock this morning, my phone was going off <clears throat> to an alert about the, uh, the Key Bridge in Baltimore. We had a uh, we hit national news today. Thanks for everyone that has reached out um, and uh, you know uh, expressed their their uh, concerns for us here in Maryland. It was a tragedy. Uh, workers lost their lives. Uh, they were filling potholes on the road. Uh, we did find out that the uh, M dot uh, knew there was a mayday call that was coming in about the ship uh, losing power and. Um, they did stop the traffic on both uh, sides of the bridge, but unfortunately they couldn't clear the bridge uh, to prevent the tragedies. Uh, so our hearts go out to the families of those that lost loved ones and family members and friends uh, in this terrible tragedy. Uh, we know that um, we take a lot for granted. We're driving down the road and you don't think about it. We've got a couple big bridges as most states in the, the country, whether it's going over water or mount through mountains. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that that was uh, that was big news today. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, mm -hmm. we are a resilient um, city. Baltimore is resilient and we will come through this. And um, but it is absolutely devastating. And as Todd had mentioned, thoughts and prayers for for the families involved. Yeah, it's amazing to me. I mean, I mean, that bridge was built back in the 70s, but it's amazing to me that even then the engineering, that one, you know, impact on one section of bridge would actually take the whole thing out. I mean, I'm just surprised there's no breakaways, things like that. That, uh, yeah. uh, But uh, anyway, hopefully. But we'll get through that. Uh, Mike Maloney, such a pleasure and an honor, man, to have you back on our channel. I wish I was in Puerto Rico sitting beside you. You moved into this amazing farm on this amazing farm tell everybody what what's your new place like in puerto rico well it's um uh it's big and it's high <laughs> uh and then, you know the great taking is part of uh all of the stuff that i look at that makes me so um uh fearful and the anxiety uh that i have about the economy uh, I typically wouldn't consider myself a prepper, except I've got 900 defensible acres <laughs> with uh, three rivers. Uh, I've got an 800-foot uh, tall mountain in the middle where I can see both the north coast and the south coast of Puerto Rico from the same spot. And uh, uh, I've got uh, 100 solar panels and nine Tesla power walls and redundant internet, and we're growing our own food. <laughs> And I'm not a gun person, but I bought a small arsenal. <laughs> so I'm sort of, I'm, I'm close to being set for whatever comes. Uh, and uh, because, uh, you know, <clears throat> I recently wrote a book, spent four years and a quarter million dollars on uh, writing and producing this book uh, and had a research team with me. And the stuff that we, you know, we were going deep on stuff. When you uh, read it and you see all of the different charts, you know, most of the sources like Federal Reserve, Bank of England, uh, the OECD, uh, and so on. And, uh, but the stuff that they've done to the monetary system is just, um, Everybody's so creative, trying to make another buck that the, the whole monetary system is tilted towards the people that are running the game. And so it's nothing but a big casino. And everything now is an illusion. Your stocks are an illusion, the bonds are an illusion, and the currency is an illusion. It's all just a magic trick. It's air. And uh, uh, that is going to come back to bite us all one day. 
And, you know, The Great Taking is a book about sort of an end game of this thing that's going on, but it's actually happening bit by bit by bit right now. You know, give them an inch and they'll take a mile, but they'll take that mile inch by inch so that you don't notice. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I know author David Webb wrote the book last year and a lot of people have been talking about it. But what concerned me, Mike, is, you know, I really respect you and your opinion on our monetary system. And, you know, we've kind of we've taken some deep dives into, um, you know, how our currency system is really backed by nothing. And, um, you know, when we talk about this book, uh, David Webb was the author, and the book is about um, him exposing the system, the central bankers, um, the system that they have in place to take everything from everyone. Uh, now, on the surface, one may look at this and say, well, this seems kind of ridiculous. Uh, and maybe a little bit of a conspiracy theory, or is it? Well, that's one of the sad things is he sort of wrote it from a conspiracy theory angle, and he didn't need to. The very fact that all of these rules, regulations, and laws have been put into place to accomplish this. I mean, uh, in the book, it, what it comes down to is that everything on your brokerage platform is not yours. It's an IOU for what should be yours. So you're in possession of IOUs for stocks, bonds, mutual funds, exchange traded funds. It's just a bunch of IOUs. And the actual shares are, uh, um, are they can be used for collateral at any time if there's a, uh, an emergency in the finance system. And so your shares can be seized and used as collateral for, uh, you know, um, selling them to the Federal Reserve uh, for currency to get through a crisis, things like that. And, you know, so I actually went and took delivery of, uh, you know, <clears throat> I've got a dozen or so uh, private placements on uh, um, exploration and mining stocks. And with those, because they're private placements, I have the stock certificates. But I also have been driving Teslas. My first Tesla was a 2010 Roadster. My second Tesla was a 2011 Roadster. My third Tesla was the 599th 2012 Model S. Uh, and so by two, by the end of 2012, I, I was on my third Tesla. Um, uh, and so I believe in Tesla and I own Tesla stock. But I sold uh, a, a third of my holdings just uh, before Christmas, I think December 24th and another third on January 4th. Uh, and I was in some pretty big profit and uh, took that profit. And then the other third, I went through the process of trying to take delivery of my stock certificates. I should have been more prepared and had that stock certificate right here. Uh, I'll uh, possibly get up and get it to, in a little while to show you, but uh, that process, I mean, I called Charles Schwab, my broker, and, you know, um, I'm talking with the representative on the phone and I tell him that I want to take delivery of my stock certificates. And he says, what? <laughs> he didn't quite understand. <laughs> and I sort of had to explain to him, I want delivery of my paper stock certificates. I want to be able to hold the stock certificate in my hand because at that point it's like cash. Uh, the brokerage house cannot use it, or the clearinghouse uh, that the brokerage house uh, may have already uh, sent the thing to, they cannot use it as collateral uh, for uh, an emergency. Uh, and if you've got a margin-enabled trading account, you may also want to consider uh, getting rid of, you know, it's back um, 20 years ago, uh, if you wanted margin, it was something you had to opt in for and you had to be qualified to handle it. There was a list of questions that you had to answer. Yes, 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 yes. I'm, uh, you know, I can, I know what margin is. I know the dangers. I'm, I'm financially sound. I can handle it. Now it's the default setting and you have to opt out. But when you are enabled for margin, you have agreed to uh, allow your broker to come in and borrow your shares. And uh, when, when they borrow shares, uh, 
uh, that is so somebody else can borrow them and sell them short into the market. And you know, here's one thing. Here's one thing to think about. Sorry, um, is uh, if you've like a lot of people buy if they want to buy gold, they'll buy the gold ETF GLD, but it's a heavily shorted uh, exchange traded fund. And so if you've got a margin account, your broker may have gone in and borrowed your shares of GLD, which represent ounces of gold that you think you own. <laughs> you loaned them to somebody else who sold them into the market and somebody else bought those same ounces. It's two owners for the same ounces. The whole thing is this Ponzi scheme scam. Uh, it's a shell game. The whole stock market is a casino shell game. I'm sorry I interrupted you, Todd. No. <laughs> no, and just, I, I, I mean, just to clarify, maybe you can explain a little bit. A lot of people don't understand that when they open up an online trading account or they have a, uh, a stock broker, and, and I'm not one, I'm not a financial advisor, uh, but you're actually, they're, they have the sh your shares. I mean, they like you're saying, they have control of your shares. And a lot of people don't realize that they can order the actual stock certificates. Now, the disadvantage of that is, you know, if you're trading back and forth, it kind of slows things down a little bit because when you own, when you have in possession that stock certificate, the only way to sell it is to send it back and, you know, to, to sell it. So you're kind of, you're not as liquid. And that's the, that is the downfall of that. However, like you said, at least you're holding it. Somebody else can't take it from you. Let's kind of talk about this book what's up with central banks i mean how is it that uh where did we kind of go off track with this because watching the documentary by the way if you guys haven't seen the great taking documentary on youtube it's it's an, a little over an hour it's pretty scary it's frightening actually because they go over you know all of the possibilities but i mean where did we go off track mike uh, we went off track when we went off of gold. Gold used to be the uh, the the base. It was the base currency, you know, base money back then. Uh, you know, I've been sort of waging a one man war, uh, trying to enlighten people on the differences between currency and money. Uh, and so that's the reason you'll hear me uh, refer to, you know, the currency supply or base currency. Uh, money has to be a store of value. Aristotle was the first person to define the key attributes uh, to be able to call something money. It's got to be a medium of exchange, a unit of account, and a store of value. And, you know, when I, it was back in 2005, I was actually on stage with Robert Kiyosaki uh, at the Los Angeles Convention Center. And he said, uh, in 1971, the U.S. dollar ceased being money and became a currency. And uh, this boom! You know, light bulb moment for me, and I spent, uh, you know, ever since then studying this. And uh, in my uh, most current book, The Great Gold and Silver Rush of the 21st Century, I really discussed this and dissected it. And uh, it, it took a lot of digging, uh, a lot, of, but the Bank of England has been very forthcoming on how currency is created. And uh, it's most of the dollars and euros and yen and so on that exist is bank credit. It's not created by the Federal Reserve. And yeah, thank you. Um, and it's done so by you taking out a loan. You find a house that uh, you want to buy and you go to the bank and you say, I found this house that's $1.2 million. I need to borrow a million dollars to buy this house. And they look at the house and they, they say, Yes, the collateral is good. It's worth 1.2. We can loan you a million on it. Uh, and you look like you've got good credit. We've investigated your background. And you sign that document, and they type brand new currency <laughs> into your uh, bank account. And then you have over a 30-year period, you've got to pay that back plus the interest. When you pay that back, it um, meets the, the credit and the debt meet each other on the balance sheet, and they annihilate each other. The, the principle annihilates the principle that was borrowed into existence. So when you're paying off the principle, uh, that vanishes. The uh, 
the interest is what the bank is going to use as profit and so on. And you have to come up with that from somewhere. And so our whole monetary system requires constant expansion. If we don't go deeper and deeper and deeper into debt, it starts to implode and eat itself uh, because the currency to pay the interest was never borrowed into existence. So we always owe more than exists. And uh, so it's, it's mathematically impossible to pay off the debt. You just have to go deeper and deeper. This all happened when we decoupled from gold. Uh, it's been a very slow process because, you know, it was the uh, base money of the country, and then there was bank credit piled on top of it. But then there was a 40% reserve ratio in the Federal Reserve Act, and then an unspecified ratio during the Bretton Woods system, and then no reserve. <laughs> no, the only reserve that the Federal Reserve has is that they own U.S. Treasuries, and the U.S. Treasury is nothing but the Treasury selling your ta your future taxes. They're selling your taxes forward, so they're they're reaching in your future and taking whatever they're going to collect from you in taxes. They uh, sell this promise to pay an investor back out of future taxation. And they take that currency and then it goes into the treasury and they spend it. Um, and uh, so the, when the Federal Reserve buys it, it types numbers into existence that didn't exist before. You got to ask yourself, how many numbers are there? <laughs> Wait. What happens? Are you one that believes that the dollar is going to collapse? I mean, we have a debt that we've never seen before. I think they say by 2030, uh, the, the interest on the debt will exceed the money that they collect from taxpayers. Do you see where, uh, I mean, wh wh where do you see this thing ending? I mean, do you see where we're gonna have, we've spoke before uh, multiple times in the last six months, and um, we both agree that it's an everything bubble. I mean, the stock market, you just said, it's ridiculous. It's all, I mean, it's so overinflated when you're looking at what the stocks are trading um, you know, the multiple to income, it's so high, it's, cr it's ridiculous, uh, but it keeps going up. And we talk about the housing market in this massive bubble, and we've looked at uh, Dr. Schiller's, you know, overvalued housing market where it could crash 50%, home prices should crash 50% in order to come into what would be considered affordable from a median income, uh, you know, uh, aspect i mean people can't pay eight nine times their uh income to buy a house the numbers don't work but yet everything just keeps going on and on and on and on and, and we've all expected that we would have some massive recession right now a crash is the recession canceled well you know um everything goes on and on and on and and this whole thing is happening very slowly until the day it doesn't go on. And then everything sort of collapse, collapses very fast. Do you remember the day that, where were you when you found out about Lehman Brothers collapse? I mean, do you remember like turning, yeah. turning up? I mean, I was in the housing business. Monday. So, you know, if they, they knew everything had fallen apart Friday and the uh, Federal Reserve, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Treasury Department, they're up all night long trying to figure out how to hold the global economy together <laughs> there you know uh and then you they come on tv monday morning and your world has just changed so this all happens uh very very slowly until the day that it doesn't happen slowly anymore <laughs> then it's very fast and it'll be the same thing uh with the dollar i've been making presentations on the death of the global dollar standard since 2009 uh, and tracking all of what I called the nails in the coffin. And after a while, I just got sort of tired of trying to keep up with this and, uh, and update it. But it's just chipping away and chipping away at it. And uh, What's that um, game with all the blocks they used in the big short where you're pushing a block out and then suddenly the whole thing falls? Uh, so you think that's still going to happen? You think that one of the reasons why we haven't seen it yet is because of I mean, is it deception? Is it is it here right now, uh, or is it the fact that everyone is just hopeful of the uh, 
the outcome in November with the presidential election? And what, what do you think? Why do you think it hasn't happened yet? Did the Fed not raise rates high enough? Are they, I mean, they don't want to crash the system, right? I mean, they're part of the issue. If we're talking about, if we want to believe this book, The Great Taking, and they're talking about how central bankers have put this whole, you know, system together to keep the elite rich. And when we look at that, I mean, we want to be in debt, everything from buy now, pay later, the latest thing. But we, we are pumped and pumped and pumped to take out loans, to take out debt. We buy a house today. If we paid it off in 30 years, you'd pay three times. You buy a million dollar house, you're going to spend $3 million by the time you pay it off. That's if you don't refinance and take equity out to do improvements down the road and, you know, kick it down even further. Um, but we're trained now that we have to be in debt. And yet you look at this monetary system, you're saying the dollar is collapsing. A lot of people say the dollar is going to collapse. But we look at it and we go, they're printing dollars. Maybe it will be devalued. At what point do we see this all catch up? I mean, we've been talking about it catching up now for well, the better I mean, part of since the pandemic. 2019, we were headed into a recession. The pandemic comes, we print more money. You know, not to get political about it, but we want to talk about both sides of the equation. I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Trump was the president when we printed more money in two years than we did in the last 200 years. When does this all catch up? Well, we are paying the price for that printing now. Uh, you know, I'm, a lot of people say that the quantity theory of money is incorrect, but I am a big believer in the quantity theory of, of uh, currency, I call it, uh, because the US dollar and no national fiat currency qualifies as money. There aren't stores of value. The dollar has lost 99% of its value since the Federal Reserve became its steward. Uh, before that, it maintained its value for the, the 100 years before that, the purchasing power was relatively the same. Uh, but um, uh, the, <clears throat> I, I think you've had Brent Johnson on the show a few times, haven't you? No, maybe no. we need to. No, I haven't. You had him on once. Um, uh, when you were oh, talking. Brent Johnson. Oh, I thought he said Bennett. Brent Johnson. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. We've had Brent on. Yes, sorry. The dollar milkshake theory. And yeah. I believe he is correct. I believe you're going to see uh, the dollar rise before a big fall. And uh, when it rises, uh, gold will be rising with it. So what to watch is the gold price. Don't watch the dollar compared to the other currencies in the basket they're measuring on the do U.S. dollar index. Those are all a bunch of currencies that have jumped out of a plane. Some of them have larger parachutes than others, and they're falling at different rates. But gold is still up in the plane. So from gold's point of view, they're all falling. They're just falling at different rates. And so if the other currencies fall faster, it gives you the illusion that the dollar is going up. But is the dollar going up when it requires more of them to buy the same house? Uh, when, when you see prices rising, is that the dollar going up? No, that's the dollar going down. It's going down in purchasing power because of the dilution of the currency supply. You've got so many goods and services. You've got a certain size currency supply. Expand the currency supply suddenly like that. And then it takes a few years for uh, the excess currency to work its way through the system and for prices to rise to account for the excess currency that they've created. But in this process, they've just stolen from you. They've just stolen, they've, they've transferred wealth from anyone holding uh, dollars to uh, the people that are the first uh, people to borrow dollars into existence during that uh, time period. So a lot of this was, uh, you know, checks that the, the government was sending directly to consumers. Uh, that really, um, you know, when Ben Bernanke did quantitative easing one, two, and three, uh, it really uh, the the Federal Reserve is constrained uh, by the Federal Reserve Act and it says that they can own they have to buy assets that are fully backed as to the principal and interest uh, by the US government so before that used to limit them to US Treasuries pretty much uh, Ben Bernanke in his uh, speech in 2002 called 
deflation, making sure it doesn't happen here. Uh, we were scared of the, a Japanese style deflation where you get caught in this trap of the zero bound. You can't take interest rates too far below zero because if you do, people will just hoard cash. Um, and uh, so he gives a speech and he says that when you reach the zero bound, you're not, the Federal Reserve isn't out of ammunition. There's plenty that we can. That's this is the famous speech where he said, we have a technology called a printing press. And all we have to do is print or just the credible threat of printing more currency, just saying that. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the paper. And everybody should read it. When I read this paper, I think it was about 2004 that I read it, I changed my life. I, uh, ha I was in a different business. I gave, I, I started that business. I was the majority shareholder. I gave my shares to my business partner. I started goldsilver.com in 2005. I started writing uh, my first book, which was the best-selling book on investing in precious metals in history, uh, produced in 13 languages eventually. Uh, and uh, uh, so that paper contained a roadmap to the future. Everything that Ben Bernanke did in 2008 was in that paper, including something he called expanding the menu of assets that the Federal Reserve can buy. Like it's a menu at a restaurant. Oh, I'll have this and I'll have that. Oh, you should try the mortgage-backed securities. They're delicious. <laughs> uh, the the mortgage-backed securities were not on the menu, but just, uh, a, I don't know if it was a week before, it was a, a week or two before Lehman, um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were nationalized. And that meant that the U.S. government was guaranteeing the principal and interest on mortgage-backed securities that, that they had packaged. So if it was packaged by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, it was eligible for the Federal Reserve to buy it. So therefore, the menu <laughs> was expanded. Does it sound like, if you, if you read that paper, it sort of sounds like this was all, they, they knew that something big was going to happen, that Lehman was going to happen. They knew that they were in a disaster, and Ben Bernanke was going, oh, subprime won't spill over into the rest of the market. Don't worry about it. Just a week before it all happened. <laughs> but they had already nationalized Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So they had already made it uh, basically legal under the Federal Reserve Act for the Federal Reserve to type currency into existence and buy those. But they have to buy through uh, a primary dealer. Uh, the Federal Reserve Act says that they have to buy in the open market. Uh, and if you're limited to just treasuries and you've got to buy in the open market, that means you can't buy directly from the treasury. You have to buy through a brokerage house. There's always somewhere between 18 and, and 30 primary dealers. These are the biggest brokerage houses in the world that uh, uh, create their own little special market, or it's it's an open market because they're bidding against each other that you and I can't buy through this market. It's a market solely created to service the Federal Reserve. And uh, so these primary dealers are market makers. They have to show up at the treasury auctions and bid at the treasury auctions. And if they uh, win some treasuries, they next week turn around and sell them to the Federal Reserve. And then with the currency that's been typed into existence, they go back to the treasury auction and buy more. It's a big uh, game. Uh, but what it does is when the Federal Reserve types base currency into existence, and the the, there's two, two forms of base currency, the cash that's in your pocket and bank reserves. And bank reserves, the public never sees or touches. It exists only in the checking accounts that every bank member bank has at the Federal Reserve. When they type bank reserves, the Federal Reserve can buy an asset from a primary dealer, such you know, uh, like a mortgage-backed security or a treasury, and they pay for it by typing brand new currency into existence that is bank reserves and paying the brokerage house's bank. The brokerage house can't be a bank, but B of A Securities can be under the umbrella of Bank of America, which is a bank. Mm. And so it's just a game of, of trying to uh, create loopholes and get around the rules that they've created. But basically, it all ends up in the financial markets. And so the inflation that we saw from QE1, 2, and 3 
only inflated the financial markets. And then uh, when they, uh, al they also stimulate the economy by lowering interest rates. And what does that do? That inflates real estate. And so what we saw from 2008 to, uh, to, to the pandemic was inflation of only those financial assets, real estate, stocks, bonds, mortgage-backed securities, and such. And then the Federal Reserve uh, started uh, typing currency into existence for the U.S. Treasury, the general Treasury General Account of the Fed. And the um, so, uh, and then the Treasury uh, sent out checks to everybody. And then we finally saw the retail inflation. Uh, so, <laughs> sorry, I went off on that tangent. Uh, if people go to ggsr21.com, and there's two chapters there. One is the shortest, easiest, and funnest chapter in the book, and it's just a primer on how to read charts because there's all sorts of ways that somebody that's creating a chart can manipulate your uh, perception of what's, yeah, that's the website. And uh, if you click on the free chapters, there's a, a two free chapters there. The chapter three is the fun one. Chapter four is the hardest one in the book. And I had to make it online because it's something that is still in process. I will be adding to it. Uh, you'll know there's a series of videos that go with each section. There's eight sections to the chapter. One of the sections on doppelganger dollars, I had to cut unless I can really prove it. Uh, but uh, it looks like uh, when uh, it's an interesting chapter, everybody should read that, but it's hard. So read one of the sections, try and digest it. If you need to read it again before you move on to the next one. But this is how currency is created. And it's, it's a, how it's a scam. It's how it enslaves all of us. Uh, it, it's uh, it's stealing from you every second of every day. You know, when we used gold, um, you would have uh, somebody would have to go out a prospect to go out and find a claim, and then turn that claim into a mine, and then uh, dig up the gold and the ore out of out of thirty tons of ore. You get one ounce of gold, and that isn't the only dirt you're moving. You may have to plow a road. 50 or 100 miles into the wilderness, and then dig a, a shaft and construct all of these buildings, and then the ore that comes out, 30 tons for one ounce of gold. So you got to uh, find it, then mine it, refine it, melt it down and uh, melt the bars down and mint them into a coin, and the coin represents all of this work. If you work and you save up a stack of these, these coins, the work that you're putting in represents the same amount of work that went into creating this true money. It's, the, it's got this stored value, and you're swapping value for value. And then you buy a house with it. And this stack of coins has the same amount of your work in it, which was the same amount of the people that originally dug it up, same amount of work, as uh, chopping down all of the trees, turning in the, them into lumber, digging up the cement, uh, digging up the copper for the wire and the plumbing and everything, and, and paying a bunch of people to hammer this thing together. And so it was a fair trade, all three parties involved, the people that created the money, the uh, person that worked and saved the money, and the people that, uh, that built that house and invested into making that house. Fair trade all of the way along. Now, today, uh, you find the house, and it's still got that same amount of work in it. But you go to the bank, and you say, I want to borrow on this house. And they say, okay, well, we'll give you some credit. And they type it up. There is no work involved. They have just committed a fraud and theft. They have bought, they have, they've, they credit your account, and you uh, are unaware when you're buying something, you're creating an exchange of nothing for something, which is, Theft. That's that's fraud and theft. It's the bank that did it, not the buyer. Oh, yeah. But um, uh, it, um, uh, where does it get its purchasing power? If it's empty currency that was just typed into existence just a few seconds ago, where did it get its purchasing power? The second the uh, borrower buys that home, 
the homeowner now has it, and that currency is out into circulation, and it gets its purchasing power by diluting the currency supply and stealing a minuscule amount of purchasing power from every other unit of currency in existence, and that causes inflation. So that inflation is the transfer of wealth through this currency system. It's evil. Our currency system is just absolutely evil. And it benefits the few at the expense of the many. The people that run the game are the ones that uh, benefit the most. But uh, well, I guess that's a question too, Mike. I mean, it, you know, it seems like a very dangerous game. <clears throat> you know, when you're talking about central banks all around the world, there's talk of you know them wanting a one sort of like a a one world uh, monetary system. Uh, you know, some say it's digital; it's coming. Um, you, you look at when I you talk about Brent Johnson, when I interview him and his theory with the dollar, a lot of people don't believe his theory because he talks as if the U.S. is a superpower um, because of the dollar being the world's reserve currency. But yet we have a lot of countries, they don't want anything to do with the dollar. They're creating their own monetary system. You have the BRICS nations that are trying, you know, uh, to develop this currency uh, where they they won't be dependent on the dollar. And, and, and they're big countries that are uh, saying no to the dollar, that are denouncing the dollar. You have up until 2023, 100% of oil trade was purchased by dollars. In 2023, that changed. Last year, that changed. I think only 40%. Um, was traded using dollars do you think i mean when you talk about the dollar uh being strong or you know everybody else's currency doing worse than ours i mean what is your opinion on uh central banks uh, them wanting to have a globalized monetary system one world power if you will some people say you own will own nothing it's the great taking they're going to take everything that we have we're looking at i want to talk about this oregon i've been reading and watching videos about how now farmers in oregon one of the states with the biggest uh you know most amount of rainfalls and than any other state in the country i mean it, it gets a lot of rain with, uh, as well as washington state they're um, putting farmers out of business uh you know if you have a half a dozen chickens you need hundreds of thousands of dollars in stormwater management now or you can't operate a farm a small farm they're shutting farmers down they want to regulate the wells uh i mean where are we going with this thing i i mean this is this is scary stuff do you think that the bricks will be successful in you know or yes, much of a detriment away. yeah yes but they're chipping away at it this is a, not a, an overnight process. It's something that is happening very slowly until the day it doesn't happen slowly and it starts happening very quickly. Uh, and so uh, they are, you know, undermining the petrodome was a key, that was a huge nail in the coffin. Uh, and which is what you're talking about that happened just last year. Um, the, you know, we shot ourselves in the foot with the sanctions against Russia and, and uh, everything that we uh, did as far as uh, confiscation of assets uh, uh, and blocking them from SWIFT and blocking, you know, weaponizing the U.S. dollar. However, there, <clears throat> Brent Johnson, uh, there's a, most of the uh, countries and entities around the world, still the majority of debt that is owed in the world is denominated in U.S. dollars. So they have to acquire U.S. dollars to service that debt. And uh, that is what will uh, cause the dollar to rise against those other currencies. And as it rises, it makes it harder to accumulate those dollars. It costs them more of their currency to accumulate those same dollars that they owe on the debt. Uh, but, you know, we're not the only place to get a loan from anymore. Uh, you know, everybody is abandoning this game. And it's something that I uh, predicted and started giving presentations on back in 2009. I haven't done it uh, uh, lately. I probably should uh, dust off my old presentations and update them 
and include all of the nails in the coffin that happened subsequently. Uh, but um, uh, the dollar can rise against the other currencies, but the canary in the coal mine is gold. And so you need to watch that over the long term. And in the year 2000, gold was just a little over $250 an ounce. And we're getting pretty darn close to 2,500 now. You know, we've hit 2,200. So, I mean, uh, and this is just in the last 20 years. So what is that in a loss of purchasing power uh, of the dollar? The gold didn't change. Your house didn't change. You know, during the Great Depression, single family medium price home was about $3,000. Did the house change? It's now 100 times more expensive in dollars, but not in gold. Uh, uh, it's uh, so there's different things to watch. As far as Oregon goes, you know, I read some some of the articles uh, about that, and this is in the Willamette Valley in Oregon. Yes, where I was born. <laughs> in the Willamette Valley in Oregon, oh, wow. south of Salem, Oregon, the capital called Kaiser, uh, about a block or two from the Willamette River. And uh, this is a wet place. <laughs> you only see the sun for a few months a year. It's uh, gloomy all the time, overcast, but it does rain a lot. Like up here, uh, I'm in, in the mountains in Puerto Rico. I'm up at uh, between 2,500 feet and 3,750 feet is the range of elevations that my farm has. Uh, and uh, uh, here, it's sort of, you know, here it probably rains a little bit more, uh, but even in the dry season, uh, at least three days a week, you're going to get uh, a rain, rain for an hour or two a day. And then in the wet season, it's like six days a week on the average that you get three hours of rain. So, uh, but in the Willamette Valley, I think what government is trying to do, <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> they're not trying to do this, <clears throat> but the, if you look at, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. <clears throat> If you look at um, what the results would be from what they're doing, they're trying to starve us to death. <laughs> they make it so hard. I mean, the you know, I'm trying to get my farm going, and we've been working on it for three years now. We're really not producing anything. We're on the verge of starting to produce some. But in Puerto Rico, uh, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture and everything else. There's just this nightmare web of regulations, and then there's uh, tax incentives, and there's grants, and any one of them can change your business plan because you're, you're trying to compete against thousands of other farmers, and everybody is trying to navigate this thing. And so, you know, we've, we've got, got this team of uh, three very highly paid people, and we're trying to investigate carbon credits right now. I've got 900 acres. I can get some uh, serious uh, uh, income from carbon credits, but there's different grades of carbon credits. There's the, uh, the uh, rabbit hole that you go down that branches into all these, the stuff that you've got to learn to make the proper decision before you get locked in on some sort of plan and then regret it uh, is it's just so incredible. We could be growing stuff instead of looking for, well, you know what? Uh, uh, cacao has just soared in price recently and the uh, government has a grant. I mean, I can get like a quarter million dollars uh, for uh, setting aside a certain amount of land and planting a mixture of plantains, cacao, and then uh, uh, grazing some sort of large, like uh, pigs or sheep or cattle or something on it as well. And I mean, that can suddenly change the direction that you've, you've been making plans, you got a business plan, and you're just about to execute, and then you find out something like this. Oh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's really, the government gets involved in everything, and they're making it very difficult on everybody. And we don't have a sunset law where uh, all of the laws expire after so many years and would have to be renewed. And 
So it's like Elon Musk uh, keeps talking about. After a while, uh, one regulation on top of another, on top of another, it's like Gulliver's Travels, where Gulliver is tied down with all these little tiny, to the Lilliputians, they are ropes. But to him, they're just little strings that are threads. Uh, but you put a thousand of them on somebody and they are tied down. And that is exactly what is happening with all of these laws and regulations and bureaucrats that should mind their own business, keep their nose out of economics. And because everything they do has an economic backlash. You know, uh, you started this with the uh, Francis Scott Key Bridge. And I was just on uh, Google Maps. Uh, poking around the area to see what kind of interruption, what what is going to be the economic impact to uh, your town? Uh, I mean, well, uh, I mean, like of, that. Well, some of the you look down there. That's where Am there's an Amazon distribution center that is serviced by that port. There is a Home Depot uh, distribution center, BMW, Volkswagen, Mercedes. There's one that wasn't labeled, but I I, I think it was Ford. There's, there's lots with thousands and thousands of cars in them. But uh, yeah, you, you zoom up, zoom, yeah, that port down there, go a little bit uh, further south. And uh, yeah, okay, zoom in on all of that. Look at some of these companies that are in here uh, and uh, all of the railroad tracks also. Um, but, you know, it's, it's now, the number of miles that have to be traveled to get stuff across that bay uh, have just dramatically increased. And then the traffic jams that are going to be happening uh, and the extra time that has to be scheduled for everything. This was a huge financial impact on the economy of your area that yeah. has just happened. And, well, uh, I can tell you, I, I know a lot of shippers and uh, a lot of them they ship up to New Jersey and they rail down or they truck down uh, from New Jersey. They make it seem like this port is such a big uh, supplier of the East Coast and that's just not not so. I mean, there is a lot of uh, auto industry that comes into the port of Baltimore, but the fact of the matter is it has been so expensive getting freight into ships into Baltimore and adds so much time and demerge and the fees and it's ridiculous. We have a beautiful port. We've got tons of regulation. We actually have one of our agents is uh, is in the Coast Guard, and you know um, he had said today all hands are on deck. Uh, but I mean the fact of the matter is we could be doing we could be using that port a lot more, and the impact we have about thirty five thousand cars a day that go across the Key Bridge, Francis Scott Key Bridge, and uh, I mean I was out today driving around looking at properties, servicing clients. And I really had very little impact uh, to traffic. I mean, we do have a lot of arteries around Baltimore. And, you know, the biggest thing is it's the hazardous material vehicles. The trucks can't go in the tunnel uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but tractor trailer trucks do travel the 895 and 95 tunnels. We have two tunnels that go into the harbor. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's still a, it's a it, it's not a good thing to have happen. I have a bunch of properties down around Amazon, which used to be down where the old GM plant was once upon a day. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, the regulations are crazy, but getting back to the property rights, because I want to dive into the, to the real estate industry a little bit. Um, I mean, now they're talking about regulating people's well water. You know, some of the, I mean, you, what a lot of people like about having private water supply and you have private water supply on your farm but a lot of people want they, they like the fact that they have their own well if something would happen to the grid for example you can have a generator you can pump your own water out of your well but now they're talking about putting uh meters or regulators on your well i mean i can remember here in maryland not that long ago they were sending out letters to everybody they wanted to tag everybody's well locations because we have very uh, a lot of older properties that aren't part of their system, um, you know, where the, the well could have been dug, you know, 70, 80 years ago, and, and they don't have great records of that. 
and they're trying to map all the wells so that they know you know exactly where your well is and things like that and a lot of people are a little freaked out about it saying hey this is my property my well i own to the core of the earth which is the way it should be with real estate um but that we don't really have that anymore that they're right. taking control of everything and you know there's a big concern they tell you what you can and cannot do on your own property we're looking at uh i have a client that wants to subdivide a property uh, which they have the right to do you're looking at a hundred thousand dollars in cost to subdivide your own property and um, and then they tell you where you can put your house you have to you can't just put it wherever you want on the property they want you to cluster houses and and uh they'll tell you where your building envelope can be so i think it's just it's frustrating that um we're just experiencing such a loss of rights and this happened about 70 80 years ago um they took our privacy rights we've given up our privacy rights we've given up the right of assembling we've given up uh you know our property rights so i mean what what is your opinion on the housing market right now do you think that we are still uh facing a real estate crash a home price crash do you think it's a the inventory issue is going to turn around or i mean we look at it you talk about inflation and how it devalues the dollar and we know that i mean it's it, we're all seeing it go buy a couple of subs i mean if you're in california it's double what it is here on the east coast but i mean you're looking at 15 bucks to go in and get a lunch somewhere um salaries aren't keeping up with that small businesses can't afford to just pay people more money with regulations that are coming down on the, the the businesses every time you turn around there's something in the construction business we have the dllr going around helmet camming employees uh, you know trying to document um you know you know make sure that employees are truly subcontractors in the in in the construction business uh, you know there are you know you can't just call somebody a subcontractor if they're riding in your truck using your tools and you tell them when to show up at the job site so we got the dllr driving around we got the dot driving around department of transportation flagging trucks and trailers and things we've got and i'm not saying that they shouldn't be doing it but you have regulations you you have um osha uh you've got all these government agencies that are coming after you know with fines and and rules and regulations you almost need somebody full-time in a six-person company to even tell you what you should be doing and not doing so these business owners are looking at all of these regulations they can't just go out and pay people fifty dollars an hour minimum wage but yet we're looking at prices that have to come down do you think that we're we will see where where is this going to break do you think we'll see home prices collapse do you think they're just going to continue just inflating away uh to uh you know be higher next year than they are right now well you know inventory has a, an effect uh, when things are closer to equilibrium economically but when you reach the economic extremes, you talked about seven, eight, nine times income uh, as far as house payments. That's an economic extreme that cannot last. Uh, when you, there, there's just a whole bunch of ways of measuring this. Robert Schiller's uh, 20 city uh, index. Uh, you know, my very first video, it was recorded i was making a presentation at the silver summit back in 2005 and i was showing dr i mean nobody had ever heard of dr robert schiller then. i mean this was uh pretty brand new cutting edge stuff to show robert schiller's uh inflation adjusted real estate index and i was showing uh the buy sell ratio on the stock on, on insiders selling you know, people that own companies selling their own stock, when that explodes and they're getting out of their own companies, basically locking in high prices, a crash is inevitable. When you see the this the Schiller index go to an extreme, a crash is inevitable. Well, it took uh, two and a half, two, two and a half, three years for it to really play out. But I was warning people back in 2004 that there was a real estate, and <laughs> this is actually, 
uh, the year before, I went on the road with Robert Kiyosaki, uh, showing all of this data to real estate investors. Do you remember the uh, Learning Annex Re Real Estate Wealth Expos with Robert Kiyosaki? Absolutely. They were here. Mm -hmm. The San Francisco one had 60,000 people. The first one I spoke at was uh, Los Angeles with 30,000 people. And Robert comes out on stage, and this is all real estate investors in the audience. And he says, real estate's going to crash, and all you flippers in the audience are going to get slaughtered. <laughs> it's exactly what happened. That was 2006. It took a year and a half, two years for it to start to unfold. But I would show them the Dow Gold ratio and uh, uh, the real estate gold ratio and stuff. And the the fact, you know, the Robert Schiller data, things like that, It's this is irrefutable stuff, and it has to resolve itself somehow. And as long as you have uh, an inventory shortage, uh, then prices can keep on going up until there's a crisis. It takes a recession. It takes some sort of, uh, you know, something lighting that fuse, and then everything explodes. Uh, and when it does, the, the, I mean, look at how fast prices fell in 2008 and nine. I mean, uh, uh, and then everything. So what became happens? What happens? I mean, we we found where you know the bail, the word has been bailouts. I mean, we already know that Fannie Mae is necessary if all of these bureaucrats would just mind their own business. Yeah. Well, I mean, we know Fannie Mae's been bundling up loans already and selling them to uh, oh, corporate America for, you know, a lot cheaper than what the properties are worth. 34 cents, 55 cents. I mean, we've had it on our show uh, is what these is what these companies are paying for these loans against what the properties are said to be worth their non-performing notes or people are delinquent. We're not hearing it on mainstream media. Nobody's talking about the crisis that's happening. Wow. I have clients that have bought just several years ago that are now getting ready to sell. Um, but yet on the flip side of it, I, I'm showing houses to, you know, a $600,000 house to somebody that wants to put an offer in. They have 35 showing 17 offers and that they accepted an offer for 140,000 more than what the list price was at 600,000 and the woman said i just have to have the agent said the the, the the buyers just said i just have to have it i just have to have the house so wh where do we see when we have people out there that are making you know over uh valued purchasing I guess the question is, when will it show up? Is it going to show up in 2025? I was just uh, showing, I think uh, it was on a video I made yesterday. Uh, there is an index that shows that uh, real estate prices on a national average, and I believe it was Federal Reserve data, fallen by 19% already since the peak in 2022. Uh, but, you know, uh, you're the one with boots on the ground. You actually see the, the prices of you know, what people are offering, what things are selling for. So uh, I don't know what to believe. I just know that things keep on going the direction they're going. They go on until the day they can't, <laughs> and then suddenly everything reverses. Uh, it usually takes some sort of shock, some sort of expert, external shock uh, to light that off. And it's, it's usually like... The uh, crisis of 08, you know, real estate started to roll over, but uh, with the Lehman Brothers collapse and the collapse of all the mortgage-backed securities, uh, everything just suddenly fell off a cliff. So um, if real estate actually has uh, rolled over a little bit uh, since 2022, then that might be the warning sign. And, you know, we've, we've been in a yield curve inversion comes to the bond yields uh, where uh, um, short-term bonds are paying more than long-term bonds uh, for a record. It, it just went past the record number of months, which was back, I believe, 
I just did a video with, you know, Russ Gray, the real estate guys. Yeah. yeah. Just did a video with Russ Gray and uh, he was really driving this home. Just now we, we broke this record for the most weeks in a row of, uh, of inversions of uh, the bond market. And uh, when it uninverts, that predicts a recession. But the longer it remains inverted, the more energy that's getting stored up and the worse the outcome is going to be. Uh, the Federal Reserve thinks they're masters of the universe. And then when they cause a problem, they blame it on something else. They don't realize, I mean, this inflation we're seeing was caused by them, them and the Treasury. And then they, oh, we've got to get inflation under the control. We're going to raise rates. And which, what does what? It hurts you. It makes it harder to buy a house. It makes it harder to buy a car. And so it's always the public that ends up paying the price. For these but it helps them get rid of the debt. I mean, they can't get rid of the debt crisis without inflation. True. Absolutely true. You know, right. so they tell us they want it to be at 2%, but they really like it to be at 15%. In fact, it probably is at 15%. Yeah. But I guess it comes to the question again. I mean, you know, how do we pay for that? How do we get the salaries up? I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's going to be a universal uh, income uh, system that I mean, that they'll step in. It seems like yeah. all the government jobs that are, you know, the only jobs available are government jobs or part time jobs. And it's it's like they want to have this universal income system uh, to where they can just create money to come back to the you know the trough but let's take some questions i'm sure you have your yeah, just create money. Yes. You, create, you create currency for currency money. yes yes thanks for the question money. mike yes <laughs> there's store of value it can't go into existence and out of existence suddenly with no effort involved yeah and yeah. and you call that fraudulent yes. currency right <laughs> yeah well it's it's uh a fraud it's theft uh and it's all perpetrated by the fraudulent reserve, or we should call it the fraudulent reverse because they are reverse Robin Hoods. Uh, they steal from the poor and give to the rich every second of every day. And you know, that's what you just said. Most people don't understand. And I've said it. I think this fiat currency is the only thing that defies gravity. <laughs> you know, all of the, you know, the, the, the poor and the middle class, even, they want this stimulus. They want the government to produce this currency. But what they don't realize is that uh, we just produced more than we've ever produced in the shortest amount of time, but yet everybody's broke and everybody's in debt. You know, and it's funny, you know, I was at Lowe's the other day and you know, the cashier said, would you like to save 5% on using your Lowe's card today? And I was like, well, of course, you know, that's why wouldn't I right so I said how many people tell you no or whatever like say no I don't want to use my Lowe's card I don't want to save five percent because that they got you that's a lot of money right and she said oh you'd be surprised about 97 percent is what she said of the people I don't know how she comes up with that but sounds good anyway tell her no they're not using their Lowe's card they're not going to save five percent and she said but you know what she said it is 32 percent interest right now Oh. And I'm like, what? Oh. My, so I pay it off every single month. But imagine, thirty-two yeah, percent interest. That's and it can nice. go to thirty-six or something. I was reading it. I actually, when I got my statement in the mail, they had a little flyer that was. Um, yes, I got it in the mail. Okay, I didn't just get it online. But anyway, I'm one that refuses that. You know, deleting the 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 mail, the paper copy. Because they want you, if you're going to print it, they just want you to use your own paper. But anyway, it, it goes to like 36 or 37% if you're delinquent, yes. if you go delinquent. But it also says that that can be indefinite. So it's not like you're just penalized. Well, I was late this month or I missed the payment. Now all of a sudden I go to 37% interest and that's in forever land perpetuity because they say that they, don't, they never have to take you back to your 32%. That's crazy. Well, the fact that people are saying no, though, that's actually a good sign because they don't want to get into more debt. I think people are like, start being like, no more credit card use. 
Well, I don't know about that, Melissa. I don't. I don't know. Just I don't way. know. But I think they're still pulling out credit cards. I, I think so, but maybe they're just not using the store credit cards as much. Who knows? Anyway, maybe they don't have good credit. If we are going to start with Kov here. Thank you so much for the super chat. We are at the point that it does not matter if the rates are raised or lowered. Just look at debt. Every imagined form of debt has jumped off the cliff. Rates only matter when debt is manageable. Beyond that, it make it's make believe. And also, Joe, if you could please pull up that poll, we had a. Um, comment here, I voted no. However, if these higher interest rates are affecting the price of consumer goods, then yes. I think we had a thousand votes. We're very close to a thousand votes. Um, so what's the poll results? So right now we've got, are you feeling the effects of higher interest rates? 68% said yes, and 32% said no. And this is where we're talking about the great taking, where, where bankers are making all the money. And um, how could somebody charge 32% interest on something? You know, it's, isn't it interesting that they wait until you're in trouble and then they whack you, right? If the Fed drops rates tomorrow and goes back to 0% interest rates, do you think Lowe's Corporation is going to send you a new credit card agreement that says, hey, we're dropping your $10,000 balance to 4.99% interest. Uh, no, they're not no. going to do that. <laughs> no. I mean, they're robbing us. So you have to be in debt because now you went out and you bought the house that you're sorry you bought because you FOMO'd yourself into it and you just had to buy because you couldn't rent another year because you thought well i'm just making the landlord rich so i'm going to buy and if i don't buy now i'll never buy a lot of people had no money down they had to have mom and dad give them and i think it was like up to 40 percent of the buyers first time buyers had gift money from their parents to buy the house overpay on it over appraised gap over appraisal gap contingency meaning they'll pay for what it doesn't appraise for. You buy a half a million dollar house for 575, you have to put $75,000 more down because the bank's only gonna give you the value of a half a million on it. So now they're forced to do home improvements because their shingles have gone bad or their furnace went out or something happened. Now they're in debt and now they're getting whacked by the banks to borrow more money. And I, I was talking with a banker the other day and they said that the home equity line of credit, they're like, oh man, this is great. We're like doing more HELOCs now than we ever have. And I'm like, well, why is that? And they said, well, they're paying off credit card debt. So they're getting seven and a half percent loans to pay off their 32% Lowe's bill. But guess what? They're not shredding the Lowe's credit card or their Visa or MasterCard that's in their pocket, all they did was free up another $10,000 that they can go to the next emergency or whatever and rack up more debt. And this is what I'm talking about. The more debt that we are incurring, this system that these bankers have built that dates way back to 1911 when they took that trip to... Uh, Jekyll Island, yes. Yeah, yeah, Jekyll Island to create the Federal Reserve, which they signed into, you know, enacted in 1913 to keep them wealthy, right? I mean, that's what it's all about, right? Yeah, well, it's, you know, uh, this was the major banks in the U.S. Uh, becoming owners of the Federal Reserve system. The Federal Reserve has stockholders. And the stockholders are the member banks of the system. And you got to look at who, uh, you know, who started those banks, who owns them, who runs them, who benefits. Um, it's <laughs> the whole thing is just a scam, a Ponzi scheme, a pyramid scheme. It's, it's just, uh, it's amazing. And the deeper you dig, that's that chapter four in my book explains a lot of that. Uh, and then, you know, I've done, several interviews with g edward griffin and um, uh, one of these days i've got we've got a video 
coming together with a bunch of animations and stuff that will be released one of these days with G. Edward Griffin in it explaining a lot of this. And uh, it's fa fascinating. And the very fact that it was so secret, it had to remain a secret for many, many years that these banks had gotten together and created a central bank. And because the banks had just created uh, the, pa the Panic of 1910, I think it was, or 1907. I can't can't remember, but um, uh, they had just created a banking panic uh, and a market crash, and they had capitalized on it. And uh, and then uh, because of that uh, panic, they arranged, Senator Nelson Aldrich uh, goes and studies central banking in Europe for a couple of years and comes back and arranges this duck hunt on Jekyll Island and it's all done in secret there you go there yeah you go. and four of them were uh you know affiliated with uh, jp morgan yeah and paul warberg the guy with the mustache there was paul warberg he's the chief architect of the federal reserve system uh he was the one that really understood it and it's so convoluted that uh senator aldrich just did not get it. They kept on explaining it to him, explaining it to him. <laughs> How are you going to create a currency? How does this work? <laughs> it's really a very difficult. Um, it was John Kenneth Galbraith that said uh, um, banking is uh, one institution where uh, complexity is used to disguise uh, and conceal rather than to reveal what is going on. And um, uh, it's it's purposely complex, convoluted, very difficult to understand, but the whole system works off of enslaving all of us in the future. Uh, what backs, you know, there actually is, people say, well, the dollars are just created out of thin air. No, they aren't. They're creating, created by enslaving you in the future. Uh, there's no gold that backs the dollar. Well, that's not true either. There's... Uh, there's gold, all of the gold that, almost all of it, that was at the uh, at Fort Knox and, and uh, owned by the Treasury, basically, uh, was uh, loaned to the Federal Reserve. And the, and, uh, the Federal Reserve printed up a bunch of $100,000 uh, gold notes that the Treasury uh, has. And the Treasury supposedly can redeem these at any time. But the statutory price of gold is uh, uh, $42.2222. And uh, that's what they still keep it on the books as. And if you go to the Federal Reserve's, uh, I think it's their H.1 release, it's called. Uh, one of the line items there shows what uh, collateralizes all of the paper currency, the Federal Reserve notes that are in circulation, a few trillion dollars. Uh, and gold is all of the gold, all of the gold that, you know, which includes the gold that was taken from the public when they nationalized gold in 1933 and supposedly went to Fort Knox. Well, the Federal Reserve has all of it. It uh, does back the physical paper notes to the tune of 0 0.4 cents <laughs> per dollar of gold at that price. However, should there be a real crisis, all they have to do is they can make the, the paper dollars fully convertible into gold at about $9,000 an ounce today. So uh, what do you think about? I know you have another question, but yeah, what do you think about the bank term funding program that's ended? Do you think that we're going to see a big crisis with banking? You know, I should be uh, more up on that, but I'm not. And so it's that's. You know, <clears throat> Peter Schiff is a really fast thinker. I think of myself as a deep thinker. <laughs> I have to ponder that <laughs> and go and look at data. And then I, I give you my uh, opinion on it. Sorry. No, no fine. you're good, All Mike. Right. How about this one? Can you talk about compounding interest or the rule of 72 as it relates to holding PMs looking through the lens of inflation? Does the inflation rate and the interest rate net out to zero dollars? Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, the inflation rate and the... Um, <clears throat> uh 
I don't know. It's another one I would have to. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, uh, I'm just not good at the at this uh, spur of the moment stuff like Peter Schiff is. Uh, I think that uh, you know inflation goes up and down, uh, and if you had a, even if you had a fixed currency supply, it would be going up and down with changes in velocity. Uh, as and the velocity is controlled by the mood of the public. How do they feel when they get scared? Velocity slows down. Uh, uh, currency doesn't circulate as much. Prices fall when they feel good. They go out to dinner. Uh, they they spend and prices rise. Uh, so um, the in I know that uh, when it comes to gold. So you're talking about compounding interest. The rule of seventy two relates to holding precious metals. Uh, precious metals don't pay interest, but instead uh, they, they've the price of gold has gone from $20 an ounce to $2,000 an ounce, which means the dollar has fallen in purchasing power by 99%. Does your compounding interest make up for that? Uh, the dollar was two, the, the dollar was worth one 250th of an ounce of gold. And now it is one worth one 22,000, 2200th of an ounce of gold. Um, you know, I don't have a, a, a interest calculator in front of me, the compounding calculator. So I can't work this calculation, but I know that uh, gold, if you look at since the year 2000, this, this entire century, uh, gold is up about 660% and the stock markets are up like two, 260%. Uh, gold compared to stocks, bonds, uh, you know, and, and if you use the Schiller, uh, index uh gold has outperformed all of the uh, for for this century uh, other than cryptocurrencies gold and silver have been the top performing assets and uh, the cryptocurrency what is your opinion on bitcoin mike do you think it's a do you think it's uh peter schiff says it's a ponzi scheme do you think that's true no it's a, a very very valuable technology the technology behind it the distributed, the full consensus distributed ledger. That's the really important part. That's where Satoshi Nakamoto really changed the world. Uh, because, and everybody is adopting either blockchain or uh, something like Hashgraph, an alternate technology. Hashgraph is actually, I believe, a superior technology to blockchain. Uh, but uh, the distributed, full consensus distributed ledger uh, has the ability to do so many things and secure everything. Uh, Bitcoin is uh, probably, it's definitely going over $100,000. It's probably going to go over a million dollars one day. Uh, a bunch of people gave Peter a bunch of Bitcoin and he lost the keys. Uh, <laughs> nobody's ever given me Bitcoin, but I am I bought my first you think game. he's bitter because he lost his key? <laughs> he can't get to his wallet. I know he jokes about it. But but I, I know that I bought, you know, a friend of mine, uh, his name was Trace Mayer, and he's sort of dropped off the map uh, lately. He wrote a book, How to Disappear, and he's done it. <laughs> uh, but he came to my house when Bitcoin was under 10 cents. Mm. This is when you can take any used computer, plug it into the wall, and start mining and get rewarded with Bitcoin. And he goes, you've got to look at this thing. It's called Bitcoin. I didn't understand it. I didn't want to get involved with it. I ignored it. And he left and it comes back a year later. It's still under 25 cents. And he goes, I swear to God, you've got to look at this thing. This, this is awesome. And I still didn't understand it. Uh, he comes back about a year and a half later in one of his two private planes <laughs> that he bought. <laughs> and... and flies us around uh, the Santa Monica mountains and, and stuff and lands at Santa Monica airport and, and tries to convince me. And I, uh, so in 2013, I started making plans to really investigate this. And in 2014, I went to a conference called Bitcoin in the Beltway in Washington, DC. And I really started to understand the technology and it shows me buying $100 worth of Bitcoin out of an ATM machine. 
What it doesn't show is that I went back a little later and put another thousand bucks in. So I bought my first Bitcoin at a uh, thousand, and then I uh, opened up a Coinbase account and set an automatic purchase for a thousand dollars worth per week, uh, all the way down to two hundred and fifty. So there was a while where I was getting four Bitcoins a week, <laughs> and, and so yes, I am a believer in Bitcoin. <laughs> I do believe that it is basically the Model T of the uh, crypto industry. Uh, that they're, you know, it's it's now got uh, these side chains that are basically patches to make an insufficient technology work better. Uh, this is not my field of expertise. And right now, I am just pissing off a bazillion uh, crypto uh, people when I say stuff like this. Uh, but, you know, I, I did make episode eight of Hidden Secrets of Money is uh, one of the most popular uh, videos on YouTube about how the uh, technology of blockchain works. And then toward the end of it, you know, it starts in 2014 and we shelved it for years because Bitcoin went down, you know, it peaked and then went down. And uh, during that period where everybody lost interest when they should have been buying, uh, it just sat on the shelf and then we found out about Hashgraph, a brand new technology uh, that isn't blockchain. With Bitcoin, there has to be a block about once every 10 minutes. And that block contains a whole bunch of transactions. And you've got these uh, hundred millions of computers that are mining rigs that are now supercomputers. And they're trying to guess a number and they're guessing a trillion times a second. They're going, is this it? No. Is this it? No. Is this it? No. <laughs> and they're burning up immense amounts of power to do this and then one of them finally guesses this practically impossible number and when it does uh, it gets rewarded with it gets to they're all as they're doing this they're all constructing a yeah episode eight from bitcoin to hbar um hash graph was just being introduced it had been introduced in new york and then this video was the next big thing that uh really introduced this to the public uh, but um, all of the transactions, you make a transaction and your transaction goes into a pool of a whole bunch of other transactions that all of the mining rigs see. And they are taking transactions and constructing a block, but not all of the blocks in the system are the same. They contain different transactions. And so when you, if, if your mining rig wins, your block that was constructed gets to be the next block in the blockchain and all the other people that have done all of this work have to throw out their, their work and start over again uh mining the next you know trying to mine the next uh block and uh, uh doing this makes it secure it has to be slowed down to one every 10 minutes because if it isn't uh too many mining rigs will guess that it, it's about a half a second that electricity is uh, takes to go from one side of the planet to the other. And so you can have these situations where two rigs get ha, have the answer at the same time, roughly. And the block, the, this chain of blocks split, it forks into two. And then they have to see how much work went in to each half of this chain. And the one that has the most work in it wins and the other one gets deleted and all of those transactions go back into the pool. Some of those transactions are not included. And, and then this one is recognized as the correct uh, chain. And so uh, you're, it, it, with large transactions, you're supposed to wait for about six blocks. Like if you were going to buy a car with, with Bitcoin, you're supposed to wait for six blocks to uh, uh, get in the chain to be sure that your transaction will never be reversed. Uh, mm. And um, What do you uh, think about the IRS now making you check a box to ask whether you have cryptocurrency? Uh, I think it shows how desperate uh, all of the politicians are. They try to figure out every way they can. See, this is the, I, I just don't understand who these people are. They think that they own our lifetimes and that they allow us to keep a certain portion of it. They own everything that you create, your work and everything, and they, they can tax you. They change the tax. They Oh, gosh. He froze. He froze. 
Okay. So where did I? Oh, there he comes back. <laughs> so, that was the IRS, Mike. Yeah, <laughs> these politicians, they think they own your life. Taxes go up, taxes go down, depending on what party is in power and so on. They uh, One side wants to tax the rich. The other one wants tax breaks for the rich. And they pass that on some other way. But either way, the federal government squeezes about 18% of the economy out of us. Uh, and uh, that's just part of the Laffer curve, I believe it is, uh, where uh, um, you <clears throat> have, if, if you've got um, zero taxes, you have the best economy. As you increase taxes, you slow down the economy. But there is this sweet spot where the government can squeeze the maximum from us that it gets regardless of how much it's reducing the economic prosperity that we get to enjoy, and thus uh, the length of our lives and the happiness and how well we can take care of our children and such. Uh, but uh, um, these politicians really think they own us and they, they seem to be trying to figure out every way to squeeze every of our lifetimes out of us. And then they know the best way to redistribute all of our wealth. And, and the problem is you take a dollar out of the real economy, the private sector, wealth that you have created uh, by taxing you, and then all the people at the IRS have to get paid first. And then it goes over to the treasury and all the people at the treasury have to get paid. And then they're going to create a department. And there's got to be, you know, Congress is going to argue about it. And all those people have to get paid. And then it goes to the White House for a signature. And all the people that are advising the president have to get paid. And then they're going to create some new department. And so there's a head of department in Washington, D.C. And all of those people have to get paid. But then they need branch offices in every single state. And every single state has to have branch offices in every city, major city. <laughs> and all of those people have to get paid. And so you pay a buck. And then uh, you pay two bucks in taxes and one dollar comes spitting out the other end to pay a teacher or something legitimate. Where if you just, if, if we were actually just paying the teachers directly, that's what's called private school. It would be uh, much more, people just do not, you know, they say, well, where would the roads come from? Well, how, they, they think the roads are free. They're not free. They cost you twice as much as if you were paying for toll roads and stuff. Uh, and so I don't know. <laughs> well, what you just what you just uh, defined, I, I always said, if I was president, the first thing I would do is go into every branch of the government, except the Department of Defense, and I would, I'd reduce everyone's budgets. I would get rid of non-essential <clears throat> workers. I mean, why do you need four people to do one person's job? I'm sorry if you work for the government, uh, but uh, it seems very inefficient. And uh, I'd bring in private sector and uh, to do most of the jobs that uh, are, are being handled by by the government right now and government employees. And and then I would turn a whole lot of paid positions into volunteers. And I think, you know, reducing the amount of government that we have in this country. I mean, it's it crazy. does be reduced dramatically. You know, you can look at. Um, the larger the government is as a percentage of GDP, the less prosperous a country is. And when you get over uh, about 18% of the population uh, on directly or indirectly uh, making their living out of taxation. So, you know, you're talking about the people in Congress, but you're also talking about the guy that mops the floors that works, works for a private company that contracts to the government. Uh, they are getting paid directly from taxation. And uh, Puerto right. Rico, and it's not, and it's not very competitive either. Yeah, Puerto Rico, I believe, has twenty three percent, so it can never be successful with that percentage of the population actually deriving their income off of the rest of the population that's creating goods or services for the rest of us. It's the creation of goods and services that are the true wealth. Well, we the don't currency. create anything, Mike. <laughs> yeah. We don't make anything here. I'm trying to produce food. Uh, by the way, you know, you were talking about water rights up in Oregon. Uh, I've got three rivers on my, in fact, uh, about 40 feet that way is my main river. But my main river, uh, there were uh, easements given uh, many, many, many decades ago, 
80 years or 100 years ago. Uh, I'm the second owner of this property. The, the farm was established in 1865, and I'm the second owner. But there are about 10,000 homes that get their water from my river. They, there is a dam on my property, the easement that has been given on my property. There's about 10,000 homes. And so now at the end of the dry season, my river is reduced to a little trickle, a creek, and I'm worried about it drying up. So I, in this area where we get uh, about 120 inches of rainfall every year, uh, uh, I am considering putting in a well, and, and with three rivers and one of them right behind us, uh, I'm considering putting in a well uh, because there may be a day when, you know, I've got the potential for hydroelectric here. I've got, uh, right now, I've got about 100 solar panels and nine Tesla power walls. I drive a Tesla, so when I'm driving up here, I'm burning sunlight. Uh, we've got redundant internet, uh, like I said, and then we're growing food and we have our own water. So um, I'm, I'm pretty much <laughs> set for anything that happens because uh, there is some pretty, you know, um, uh, Al Gore did an inconvenient truth. Well, there's a very a bunch of uh, uncomfortable truths out there when it comes to like the power grid. And we just saw what happened, what can happen with the traffic grid, grid with that boat losing, you know, that. Uh, container ship losing power. Um, what a disaster. So yeah. but, imagine yeah. that on a mass scale. Yeah. Uh, the government telling farmers in the Willamette Valley that uh, they uh, can't irrigate and they've been doing it for a hundred years or whatever. Uh, and you can't do water, rainwater collection. <laughs> this is what's insane is, is you, you'd have to have a license for that. Now, I suppose somebody could just pick a higher spot on their farm and sort of accidentally dig a trench <laughs> and redirect. Uh, yeah, farming. well, they're doing satellite imagery, so they know everything about you. I mean, how are they finding these small farmers? They're doing it from satellite. Yeah, yeah. And that's, it's, so it's, you know. it's, it's becoming a nightmare, and more energy goes into doing this than actually growing the crops and supplying the food that everybody needs. And that is the problem. They need to reduce the, uh, the bureaucratic burden on farmers, not uh, continue increasing. They think they're doing something for the public good, but the ultimate damage. Mm, I question that, man. I don't know if they think they're doing something good or not. I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, yeah, I guess you could give them the benefit of the doubt by that, but I, I don't, I, I'm not so sure that I'm that optimistic. I think that, uh, I mean, at some point you have to, and when you're working, enforcing these regulations, at some point you have to sit there and say, like, uh, this is crazy, right? I mean, don't you? I mean, at some point, I mean, you could, kid somebody or you know lie to them but then at some point when you're actually working the job you would have to say like this is crazy like why why are we doing this why are we taking why, why are we taking these rights away from people i know you have a stack of there's questions. there's a ton but we'll, yeah. we'll see what we can get to um yeah. mike how about we've got a couple questions or comments here a question and a comment get your money out of banks is one of the comments and then we had another one here it's not money it's currency and it's a good idea i always keep um, a stack of uh, 20s maybe a foot tall <laughs> okay and then another one goes on to say should we the people draw our deposits in banks now before the collapse what are your thoughts on that uh you know you you modern life just doesn't work without the banking system you've got to be able to pay bills you got to transfer uh currency uh i keep uh, it, it it's good i think to keep somewhere between 30 and 90 days worth of uh, cash on hand of living expenses so whatever your cost of living is per month uh you should keep that on hand uh i also i don't i, I don't keep this stuff i've got a place where you have to go, it's miles away from here, but I can get to it and you have to go through a security gate, 
past the security guard, up an elevator with cameras, and then uh, you know into this secure room where I have my safes. <laughs> and so uh, it's not something where if you if you keep too much at home or buried in your backyard or something, and anybody finds out about it, you're definitely at risk. You're putting yourself and your family at risk of uh, armed robbery even. And that can be a very uncomfortable situation. And so, but um, I do keep um, some gold where I could get to it and some silver where I could get to it, some currency where I could get to it, and some guns where I can get to them really easy. <laughs> so Got that's Robert, how you protect yourself against the armed robberies huh <laughs> yeah robert kiyosaki says you want the 5g you want a defensible ground you know real estate ground grub uh gas guns and gold the five g's <laughs> You know, I do, before before we get out of here, I do have some gold questions for you because that, to my point, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, buy gold. And uh, I like the clip where Dave Ramsey says, if the dollar collapses, if we have a currency collapse, uh, you don't need you don't need gold, you need bullets. Uh, you know, because people know you have something, they're going to come after you. I mean, they're going to come and get it. It's like they, they talk about... Uh, well, if the grid goes down and I'm a prepper and I have all this stuff and I'm going to run my generator and I'm like, if you're the only house in the neighborhood that has lights going on or, you know, power going, you're the only one that seems like you're, you're surviving well, people are going to come crashing down your door as their, you know, own family is starving. Uh, so I, I really struggle with a lot of this stuff because, you know, I just figure we're in this, I mean, we're, uh, whatever i'm uh, what can you do about it somebody commented well our cell phones track us yeah i, I mean so, I, I always catches me by surprise you know when i see people they have the little tape over the the camera and they've got the little you know whatever uh the the the, the thing to protect their credit card numbers from getting stolen and i'm i'm always like what what's your deal man i mean like you're Anywhere you walk outside, you're tracked. Your credit cards are tracking you. Your dollar bills, I think the $100 bill, isn't that blue strip on it, a tracking device? I mean, they, everybody, they, look, they, if, you're, if you're doing these things and you're a ghost in the eyes of you don't think that you can be tracked or followed, you're probably on a very short list of people that they watch, especially hard right they're probably like looking at you saying like why does this person not have this or that or yeah i don't know well you know i think the cbdc's uh you know there's there is still sort of a rush to try and develop these uh and in the next crisis that's when they would be launching them but once they get us all on that uh that means that uh with every subsequent crisis or the more deficit spending that they want to do, the more currency creation, they can just uh, tax you. They can transfer more and more wealth away from you, more and more of your working hours, uh, you know, in, in tax. They can, but Mike, what do we do about it? Well, you've got owning hard assets is a good thing. Uh, farmland wasn't in an extreme bubble. So I bought a bunch of farmland. Uh, I've got precious metals and then on a for a bet that is on the upside where uh, you know the bright side of humanity I've been driving Tesla Roadsters since the uh, you know since before the Model S since before people knew the name Tesla uh, and it was great by the way it was like a private club you got to go to all of the Tesla events when they would launch and when they unveiled the Model S, when they unveiled the Model X, the supercharger, it's all down at the Hawthorne Design Center uh, in the Los Angeles area. And I lived about 20 miles away up in the Malibu Mountains. And so, I'd, and you get to meet Elon Musk. He'd sit there and he'd introduce the new product and then he'd step off the stage right into the crowd and spend the next four hours in the crowd. Uh, and, uh, but um, uh, I have, a bunch of Tesla Roadsters now. I've been buying them as an investment because collector cars have been one of the best performing investments since the 80s. They've been 
going up and they've been going up at a rate that's outpaced the stock market. It's been better than stocks or bonds. If you pick the right collector car, it can be a huge winner. Um, back in 2006, you can still get a Lamborghini Mira for between 40 and $60,000. Those same cars today are 1.1 to 4.25 million. Uh, what do the people do that don't have that kind of money though? I mean, if you're, if you're in your mid thirties right now and you're trying to figure out, you know, how to survive, how to keep money in your pocket or currency in your pocket. Um, I mean, what, what do you tell these, what do you tell these young people now? I mean, of course, a lot of them I think are brainwashed, um, you know, into thinking that everything is great and they don't ever have to, I mean, we, you know, then you get to be, uh, older and you realize, wow, I didn't save anything or do anything or prepare in any way. Of course, there are people that prepare and aren't making it right now. I mean, what do you tell these people? What, how, how do they keep money in their pocket versus just having it all inflated away and taxed away? And I mean, what should they be doing? You know, you tell these young people to buy gold and they think this is a, I mean, I, I've had, I've interviewed a lot of people about this topic of gold, you know, buy gold, gold is the money or buy silver. And a lot of people have a hard time understanding or getting it because they think of the physical gold as being dangerous. They have to go meet somebody or go buy it. You people know if you're buying it. I mean, don't they know that you have it? Well, um, you there's the risk of it, owning it. You buy it at my website, goldsilver.com. We can ship it to your house. We can open up a storage account at Brinks in Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Salt Lake City, or London. Uh, and uh, uh, we can um, uh, put it in your IRA. It has to be held in a vault. Uh, it's uh, very, very liquid. It's it's more liquid than most stocks as far as how quickly you can sell it and, and have cash back in your account. Uh, and um, uh, it has, like, I, you know, my first purchase was October of 2002. I, I bought a tube of gold eagles. And they were, uh, um, the gold was at selling at $315 was the spot price. Uh, back then. And so it's gone from 315 to, and gold eagles are about $50 over spot price. So you're talking about 2225 or $2,250 uh, range. Uh, you know, that's not bad. That's outperformed everything else. So uh, it, it did very, if, if you had a bank account with compounding interest, uh, first of all, the compounding interest until they raised the rates was nothing. It would take you uh, a thousand years to get the return that I just got in, in the last uh, 15 years. So, uh, I mean, I write about that in my uh, book. <laughs> I used to have a, a CD back in the uh, 1980s that was at 16 point, a three year certificate of deposit at 16.9%. And, you know, my bank was offering, I think it was 0 0.03 or something, or 0.3 uh, when I was writing the book. You know, they changed, they raised the interest rates after that. The banks were offering nothing uh, back before the pandemic. And so, um, what do I say? I say that uh, silver is still below its 1980 high. Name something else in all of society that is selling at a discount to its 1980 high. Uh, you can't. It's it's only silver, uh, and the price of gold and silver is mostly set by paper future. They're not even paper. It's just digital futures contracts. It's trading back and forth, making up ounces of gold and silver that don't exist. The amount that's traded on any given day absolutely dwarfs the amount of physical gold in the vaults that can be delivered into these trades should someone ask for delivery. And we are at a setup right now. Gold is rising. It's doing a little bit of a pullback right now, but it'll continue rising. And you're going to see it over 2,500 at the end of the year, probably maybe a lot higher. I believe, I think, you know, the last, um, uh, the last crisis, the, the 2008 global financial crisis, 
occurred before the elections. It was <laughs> this, you know, it, it didn't wait until after the elections. And I just feel like sometime this year, probably before the elections, that we're going to have some sort of crisis and some sort of emergency. And gold drags silver with it. But silver always at the beginning, uh, gold drags silver, silver lags. And right now, that is exactly what it's done. It still hasn't broken out into uh, new highs yet, it, even new recent highs. I mean, it hit $48 in 2011. Uh, it was 50, the, the intraday price on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in January of 1980 was 52.50. So that's the high. And the highest it's been since then was 48. And uh, we are going to see it sometime or another. I just don't know exactly when, but it's going to coincide with a crisis and monetary demand. Because as just as when people were buying gold back in the 70s, Gold had been 35 bucks an ounce. By October of 1979, it was $400. So it sort of stalled there for a little while. Uh, and, and people realized that, wow, this was only $35 just eight years ago, and now it's $400. That, and the average income then was just below $10,000 per year. So you take a guy that's, uh, you know, um, in the middle of his life and hasn't accumulated a lot yet. And he goes to the bank and he takes out $500, which when you're only making $10,000 a year, may have been a large portion of his savings. And he goes to the coin shop and he says, I want to buy gold too. And they plop one coin in his hand. And he goes, oh, is that all I can get? How much is the silver? Oh, you can get 50 of those for each one. Of the, oh, well, give me the silver. And it's when the public changes their their preference from gold to silver that silver always soars. And uh, that will happen. And I don't know if it's going to be at $3,000 an ounce or $5,000 an ounce, but mm. I absolutely believe that, you know, right now silver is 24 bucks. And so I you're saying, so what you're saying, Mike, it's is there are more, more people can buy not to interrupt, but there are more people that can afford silver than gold is what you're saying. So when people realize or wake up and say, I need to buy something other than I need to you know, take some of this fiat currency and buy some money. What yeah. you're saying is they're going to they're going to want to buy silver because so right now we just don't see people doing it. But the minute that we have a change in current events, we're going to see more people because it's more affordable going out and buying silver than gold, and that will make the silver prices rise. Yes, and if gold doubles, you're going to see silver do a quadruple or, or even greater. Right now, the gold-silver ratio, uh, the exchange rate between them, uh, it takes about 90 ounces of silver to buy one, one ounce of gold to equal the same value. Well, it was 14 in January of 1980. Uh, so silver's value compared to gold was far, far higher. Right now it's 190th. Back then it was 114th. Historically, you know, for thousands of years, it was somewhere between uh, 1 10th and 1 15th. Uh, you know, the, uh, if you look back at the fixed ratios under the gold standard and so on, the bimetallic standards, uh, uh, one, 14 to 1, 15 to 1 was the average ratio. And it makes sense if you look at what the mineable supplies in the Earth's crust, that was about the ratio of mineable supplies. So you dig it up and the ounces floating around in the currency supply, the money supply back then, because that was real money. It didn't vanish. When you paid somebody, it didn't like meet the debt on the balance sheet and vanish. <laughs> uh, yeah. But uh, um, this, uh, the silver uh, is in a situation, it's an industrial metal. It has to be used. We mine it and we, we use it up and throw most of it away. And uh, uh, it's, uh, so the above ground supplies are very small compared to what is traded. And when monetary demand hits this inelastic uh, supply, and the most of the companies that produce silver, it's a byproduct of mining other metals, such as copper. What happens in a recession? 
Do you sell more copper for plumbing and wires for house houses and stuff, or do you sell less? You sell less. That means there's less copper being mined, which means less silver coming to market. That's where the majority of the, the, the primary silver producers uh, make up a minority of the silver supply. So the supply starts going away just as there's demand. And the only way to resolve that issue is by price. And so silver, I, I absolutely believe that you're going to be silver, seeing silver in the triple digits uh, sometime uh, you know, within this decade that we're, we're now in. Uh, it's, it's probably going, I believe both of them are going to start soaring in the next crisis. Because throughout history, whenever we uh, expand and dilute the currency supply and take on a bunch of debt, Gold and silver sort of lay in wait and then suddenly rise and catch up uh, with all of that and and sort of do an accounting of the expansion of the fiat currency supply. It's just history repeating, but with a little twist. And with the amount of stored energy uh, that I see, with the amount of deficit spending and the expansion of the currency supply that we have done, uh, this move should be spectacular. Just going to touch on this super chat here from Charles. Thank you so much. I was in training the Marine Corps during the GFC. I own nothing and didn't know finance. So I didn't know what had happened during it. I just knew Obama threatened to not pay us. So I hated Obama. <laughs> well, you know, I disrespect all politicians equally. <laughs> just, um, but, um, and we thank you, Charles, for your service. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you know, um, I didn't. The the reason I got into this is because uh, I didn't know why the net, you know we went into the tech bubble of two thousand, and then the stock markets crashed. And I was going, why? My father had left my mother an estate that should have taken care of her for the rest of her life, and uh, and her financial planner lost the majority of it in that uh, crash. And, uh, and so we ripped it away from him and I really started studying the markets. And uh, when you study the stock market, you've got to study the economy because it affects the, and then once you study the economy, you can't do the US in isolation. You've got to uh, start studying international trade flows and current account surpluses or deficits. Uh, and, and so you're talking about international payments and stuff. And when you do that, the people that were really concerned about uh, uh, current account deficits and surpluses, the economies becoming warped around the world and out of balance with each other, were the hard money advocates, the gold and silver people. They also love monetary history and how it repeats. And that's when I fell in love and went down this rabbit hole that I've been in now since uh, 2021 when I started <laughs> studying the, not 2021, 20, 2000 when uh, I started studying the stock markets. But uh, I had been sort of on the sidelines uh, before that, just like uh, this former Marine. And during the GFC, uh, I was sort of in that position to watch the gold rush of the 70s. And I remember the panic uh, that was happening at the at, in uh, December of uh, 79 and January of 1980 with lines uh, in Los Angeles, Channel 5 had the first news helicopter in the United States called the Channel 5 Eye in the Sky. And I remember these uh, helicopter shots of the line of a local coin shop that was just about four miles up the street from me. The line went out the door and filled the sidewalk, you know, sidewalk on a major city, four lanes wide street, 15 feet wide, filled the sidewalk, went up and around the corner and down the side street. And there were reporters interviewing people in line in this panic to buy gold. Uh, and the lines were being compared to Star Wars and, and Apocalypse Now. And uh, I uh, got to know that dealer later on. And he said, yes, we were getting two deliveries from Brinks every day. And by the end of the day, there wasn't a single scrap of metal left in the place. Every single day it was going on like that. It had become a real panic. And you were hearing the price of gold hourly on the radio. Uh, it, this was one of the biggest rushes. That, I mean, and it's happening actually right now in China. The same exact thing is happening in China today. And uh, uh, so 
we could see um, the uh, Chinese market uh, drive the gold price internationally on. Uh, their real estate sector isn't doing that well, and their stock market isn't doing that well. And the only other choice they've got, really, is uh, going to cash, which is, you know, inflating your wealth away, or go to precious metals, which has been protecting wealth for, you know, it's been the predominant currency for about 5,000 years, and it's been money uh, for about 2,600 years. And so... Um, uh, it's it's the place people run to for safety, and there are these brief moments in history where it simultaneously becomes the asset class with the greatest potential gains in purchasing power. And I do believe that we're in one of those cycles right now. I know we're going to be wrapping up here soon, but I think this is an important question for you. How do we prep for this coming collapse? What course of action should we take? You know, nobody knows how bad this is going to get because it may not be a collapse. It might just be a very long and deep depression or something like that. Um, and there will be, you know, Milton Friedman and Murray Rothbard both came to the conclusion that what caused the Great Depression was the government and the Federal Reserve. It should have been a garden variety recession they took, or even a bad recession. But they took that thing that should have lasted six months to two years, and they turned it into the Great Depression with their actions. Um, they're going to try to come to the rescue again, and they're going to make things worse, just like they did back then. Instead of no, but no government official or uh, person at the Federal Reserve wants to believe in the free market and that it, in its auto balancing. I mean, it's basically the trillions upon trillions of transactions that we're all making becoming like this giant brain. It's doing the price discovery mechanism. There's calculation going on throughout society all the time, trying to set supply and demand in equilibrium, but the politicians and the, the economists won't let it. And it's when it builds up all of this energy because of the warping that they cause. When, when it tries to rebalance, it, there's this sudden snapback and you get something like a depression to wipe out all of the excess they've created to try and uh, live up to all the promises that they made. And so I don't know how bad it is. How do we prep for it? Uh, try to be diversified. Uh, you know, bullets will make a good currency. It is good to have some silver, some gold, some cryptos. Uh, I, I believe cryptos and gold and silver are allies in freedom. Uh, I don't. Uh, I'm, I don't see cryptos as like a competitor to gold. I see it as an ally, and so I own both. Uh, also, though, you know, I was talking about the Tesla Roadsters. You can't drive an ounce of gold or a share of stock, uh, but you can <laughs> drive certain vehicles that you then can sell down the road for double or triple what you bought them for. And I believe that that is also a smart move. So. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just add to that too. I mean, I, I think an important thing for people to do, you know, I personally think that the jobs market is our biggest threat right now, that we could see massive layoffs and, and, and a lot of unemployment. We are starting to see where, you know, I sit there and say, well, the housing market seems to be selling for higher and higher. But I mean, we do know that home prices have come down, respectively speaking, from 2000 and 22 but we're not seeing the what we're not seeing a market adjustment that yet that people are hoping for the unfortunate thing is is that in order to get that i believe that we need to see high un unemployment and i think that's coming i think that as we're starting to see the uh depletion now of all the stimulus that these businesses received the ppp money more specifically that really padded a lot of the businesses pockets uh, when they didn't necessarily need it uh, but i think that now as that money's starting to run out and we are seeing the results of high inflation we're not going to probably see deflation we'll see more likely stagflation which means that we're going to be stuck with these stubborn high prices or the sticky inflation i don't think we're hearing the numbers straight but we are starting to see where businesses are slowing down restaurants are slowing down 
supply companies are slowing down. Yes. Construction is slowing down. So as a result of that, what comes is lo job loss. And then once we start seeing job loss, people are not, they're already picking and choosing what bill they pay. We know this because we see it with the consumers, the buyers. And they're picking and choosing what they can pay and what they can't afford to pay this month. And once that starts happening, so how do we prepare for that? We prepare for that by not buying things we don't need. We prepare by paying down your highest interest credit card first. Stop spending. When you're investing in stocks in the stock market, but you're paying minimum payments on your, you know, you're investing in your retirement pension, uh, you know, at work, and because they're matching you, but yet you're paying 30% credit card interest rates on your debt. Get rid of, in my opinion, sell those stocks and pay down your debt. Get out of debt. And if you're yeah. in a house that you can't afford, get rid of it. Yeah. Start to consolidate. You're going to live a lot healthier by not having the financial stress should you lose your job. And I think yeah. that's the biggest threat that we have right now. The job market has to come crashing down at some point you've got automation ai and businesses that overspent labor because their demand was there and it's not anymore so and and the result is because people can't spend go to home depot you know i have people that say oh well my home depot is busy and look at what they're buying I mean, you're not seeing the contractors at Home Depot like you used to see them two years ago where they're lined out front at 6 o'clock in the morning waiting for them to open their doors. Things are slowing down. The economy's slowing down. Jobs are going to be lost. You know, I think part of the reason that the Fed raised rates in the first place, they, I think they would have been fine inflating the debt away, but um, raising rates gives them... <clears throat> You, you talked about people paying more than the asking price of a home and, and competing to buy that home. But there's a whole bunch of other people where they look at uh, the, the uh, where rates are now and they hear the Fed saying that there could be rate cuts later this year. And they want the home, but they're going to wait. And I think the Fed knows that there's like this cache of people out there that are, are waiting uh, for rate cuts. And so when a crisis comes and they cut rates, they are expecting that a whole bunch of people will borrow currency into existence and expand the currency supply by, by buying homes and stuff. But it does. They're already work. broke, though, Mike. They're broke. These yeah. people are broke. We, we have such a the, the buyers right now. This is like. This is just stupid money, in my opinion. I mean, when you're taking a six hundred thousand dollar house and giving them one hundred and forty thousand dollars more for that house. The house I'm talking about is 50 years old, over 50 years old, needs a ton of work. It's a nice house, but it needs a ton of work. There are certain uh, attributes to the house that don't appeal to everyone. To fix or make those changes would be hundreds of thousands of dollars. People are stretching right now. They're just it, the way that people are, that I see consumers behaving is they are they're stretching. I mean, I have buyers. They tell me they want to be within a thirty minute drive time of their work. I spoke to them last weekend, and they said, "Oh, well, we want to look at this area now. It's fifty minutes if there's no traffic." And I'm like, "Why are you changing? Why are you giving up this box?" that you don't want to drive more than why do you want to live your life three hours a day if you have traffic during rush hour in a vehicle five days a week why are you giving that up well because they're getting desperate because the inventory hasn't hit the market right now we're not making decisions based on common sense we're back to the same fear of missing out and making irrational decisions based on what we can't have right now and this is going to spank a lot of people man there's going to be a lot there are a lot of people that bought houses this is just my, in my industry in the last three years they shouldn't have bought houses yes you know, the government's enabling them 
you know, you have FHA is the, in my opinion, the subprime lender that we had back in the GFC. We know delinquency rates are up and they're going up even more. We know the debt is high and we know this is a house of cards that has to come tumbling down. I mean, it's either that or the government just has to make universal basic income and print money to where our money doesn't mean anything and they'll just tax us more and we just won't have anything. But how people can afford these seven, eight hundred thousand ID, a lot of these houses are, in my opinion, junk. That they're yes. selling these new homes. They're junk. Seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars for junk. You know, when you talk about universal basic income too, that is just a form of theft also, because they're going to create currency that dilutes the currency supply and steals a little bit of wealth from everybody and causes constant inflation that we will never escape. And if the inflation gets really bad, the central bank digital currencies uh, make it so that you have no other choice. You have to stay in the system. Uh, so uh, best thing, you get, get out of debt and own real assets at this point. Um, that's all I've got to say. Real assets and get out of debt. One more question? Yeah, perfect. Then we'll wrap it up. Question for Mike, how do I get into where I can buy silver from you with an IRA? I have Charles Schwab account, but I want to get an account, but I want silver to be where it's physical. Um, well, uh, just go to goldsilver.com and uh, there's instructions on there and you can call one of our uh, customer service people and they will get you set up with, uh, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not in the day-to-day workings of it anymore but um uh when you call that number up at the top you can reach somebody that can help you uh do the um physical ira where it is actual physical in a vault the ira the government does not trust you to take delivery of it because you can claim that it's in your ira then and sell it on on the side and not actually have it. so they want to make sure that there's a custodian that's responsible that actually does have it in the vault as long as as long as it is inside your IRA. But yeah, it's there. So that's one way. All right, Mike. Well, we appreciate you, man. We've we've got a couple more recordings coming up with you, and uh, they're going to be exciting. Uh, it's always fun chatting with you. I love it when you get into the charts. So uh, hopefully, we'll get to dive into into some charts. And guys, we appreciate you spending your Tuesday night with us. But Mike, any parting words? Uh, no, I just want to thank you so much. And it amazes me that you are a real estate guy that is so uh, concerned about the economy and that you've learned so much about economics and how things are working and the way these bubbles work and how they always have to uh, come back down to earth and reach an equilibrium with the rest of the economy. So. Um, Kudos to you, Todd. You've done a really great job. I appreciate that, Mike. You know, I watch people like you, and I listen, and I learn. And I also know what I don't like. I'm not happy about the way things are right now. I mean, it's, you know, we don't like to, you know, some, a couple of the comments saying that I need, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, to lighten it up a little bit. But, you know, I'm concerned about people that uh, yes. they're getting into debt. And look, man. I mean, I've made mistakes. Uh, certainly we all do. Uh, but if we could learn from people that have made mistakes, and you can just make a little bit of difference. You may not listen to your mom and dad, but maybe you'll listen to people like Mike Maloney. Go to his YouTube channel. Subscribe to it. He has an amazing uh, channel. Great information. Mike, I think you've spent more money in video productions than anybody I've ever seen. Uh, he actually goes to... Um, a museum and talks about the big currency from the beginning of time or money and yeah. uh, a cool channel. It's just a great channel to go to check him out. Uh, also, his books are fantastic too. Uh, you, you were talking about episode five of hidden secrets of money where I toured Germany's Bundesbank. Yes. That's one of the great, I, I'm the only person you're ever going to talk to that has toured seven national money museums. And I believe that we have filmed in uh, six of the seven uh, got permission to film, including yeah. uh, 
the uh, Money Museum in Beijing, China, right off of Tiananmen Square. Uh, fascinating stuff, actually. Uh, so, Definitely. Uh, you know, um, go to ggsr21.com and read those free chapters because uh, the chapter four will change your entire outlook on how this monetary system works. It is evil. <laughs> it transfers well. Uh, and it really does benefit the few at the expense of the men. Well, we appreciate you, man. We love spending time with you. And uh, guys, thanks for your Tuesday night. Melissa, thanks. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Mike. Thank you, viewers, so much. I did just want to make a little comment here. Someone had a request. Get a home insurance expert on next, please. I will tell you, we have an insurance expert coming in April. So stay tuned. And looking forward to another Tuesday next week. Yeah, it's fun because he is no longer in the insurance business. He's going to he get sold it his straight. brokerage, and he is going to, uh, I don't know, man, might be some gaslighting going on, too. <laughs> We're <laughs> so here for it. We're ready. Might be gaslighting the insurance industry. Uh, all the things that uh, you, someone with a license wouldn't tell you. But anyway, all right, guys, until next time, we'll see you soon. See you soon. Thanks.